Hi guys, I'm Josh Perkins with The Blacksmith Story, and on this episode I'm with my good friend, Chris Schaefer. Uh, known you for what, 10 years? About that. 11 yeah. maybe. Uh, been a good buddy. Done lots of smithing together over the years. Yep. And uh, this time around, got to spend about eight days with you. Yep, this is day eight. Day eight. Uh, so why don't you tell the viewers a little bit about yourself? Sure. I'm Chris Schaefer, and I have a small little forge called JWL Ironworks here in Williamston, Michigan. Uh, I've been smithing for about six years, but I've been a lifetime maker. Um, probably uh, was a maker before the, the term was coined but uh, and didn't realize it. <clears throat> Started out my career uh, mostly in woodworking. You know, I looked at the cabinet work and you know furniture work and I thought oh that's that's awesome you know I want to do that and uh, and it, that just wore out of it. it it wasn't something I realized I didn't have a passion for it and then I thought oh body work you know cars racing did that for for a decade or two um, and then I found blacksmithing uh, I won't, won't lie to you <clears throat> forest and fire was my inspiration uh, I thought I thought knife making was going to be my my thing, and I made a couple knives, and I'm like, yeah, that's that that was fun. Uh, but it really didn't didn't inspire me long term. It, you know, it was something that I, it was kind of a passing fad for me. Um, then I started watching some other smiths on YouTube and got into it and decided blacksmithing might might be the place I want to go. You know, in recent years, I've picked up some machine tools, a lathe, mill, and uh, We'll talk a little bit about the big lathe, but um, you know, I really just keep keep this evolution of making in my uh, in my life. So, we recently started up an Etsy store, and uh, you know, last fall, and and started a YouTube channel here a couple months ago. I want to start documenting some of the work we do in the shop. So, <clears throat> nice. Yep. Speaking of making, one of the things we made this week. Dun dun dun. dun. Hammer eye tongs. Where did you put go? the billet? There it is. It's right here. <laughs> so if you don't know what they are, hammer eye tongs are for picking up big billets of steel and working with the striker or under a power hammer. They are indispensable for making large tools or even small tools. Uh, this pair will be given away to you guys. Uh, stick around to the end of the interview and I'll give you those details but you're definitely gonna want these absolutely so Chris how did you get into it I know you said the forge of fire was your inspiration but where'd you start like uh, building yeah. your own forge or built my own forge uh, you know a, an old air canister uh, followed a YouTube video on how to make the burners you know and I forged probably my first three years uh, maybe even four years in a propane forge Almost exclusively. Well, exclusively, I didn't have a coal forge. You know, no solid, solid fuel. So uh, it, that's tough. Learning on a propane forge, watching the dollars go out the window as you're as you're burning it, as you're, you know, burning. I was burning the last fuel too, but you know, cooking it and oxidizing it, and it was disappearing faster than I knew how to work it. But and talking about burning dollars, yeah. like when you're working propane. It's important to uh, keep iron in it and constantly be working. Because right. every minute something's not getting hot, that's money out your pocket. Yeah, it was. I, I think probably if I were to do that over again, I'd, I'd go back and do a solid fuel, uh, either charcoal or or uh, or coal, to start off. Uh, I think economically that's probably cheaper to learn from. Uh, also, you get heat. You know, in a propane forge, you have to have excessive amount of patience to make sure that you got you know the heat the the steel heated all the way through so that you can work it properly um, as a new smith I didn't understand all of those things I thought as soon as we had color we start hitting it and uh, letting you know, your forge come up to temperature before right. you put a billet in there yep uh, get that good non oxidizing temperature going yep you know. so if I were to do it over again I would do a solid fuel but um, I had a Harbor Freight anvil actually sitting right next to me on the floor, one of the blue ones, not one of the new beautiful Doyles that we've all seen the reviews on. Uh, 
you know, and that got me by. That's a good thing to learn on. You, you can hit it, make dents in it, ruin it. It didn't cost you much. You can decide whether or not that's part of your, uh, you know, you have a passion to continue this before you start putting, you know, serious dollars into the into it. And then you have a nice paperweight. That's right. Yeah. Actually, I use it as an upsetting block. Yeah. Uh, so I can pull it out and still uh, still upset large barred steel on the floor on it. I don't, you know, I don't feel, uh, I don't feel like it was a bad investment to start out with, and and I can still use it today. So, um, obviously, I've upgraded. Uh, currently, uh, daily driver is a Holland anvil. So I think it's a hundred, hundred pound, maybe, whatever that is. Double horn, uh, easy to move around. Uh, we took it with us uh, on a trip. It wasn't too bad to move, but uh, like I said, it sits right here. It's my daily driver. I, I love it. So, uh, how long have you been smithing? Uh, in earnest, probably six years. Uh, I think I built the forge six and a half to seven years ago. There was a lot of fumbling going on in those uh, in that first year. I don't know if I would call, I would call that smithing. <laughs> a lot of learning. Beating hot steel, anyway. Yeah. I uh, think the, the <clears throat> best part was is uh, Josh and I knew each other through uh, through our employment. And what do you do? Uh, For the viewers, I know. My, what you my do. day job. Uh, I am a. Uh, a manager of uh, network architecture for a uh, large telecommunications company. So, um, so boring stuff for you non-technical people. Yep. Uh, boring stuff for you technical people. <laughs> <laughs> sit, sit in front of a computer all day on on conference calls, uh, talking to technical people. So, this is my this is my release. This is this is how I uh, de-stress. You know, come out and hit some hit some hot steel. Feel a lot better. Go to bed. Wake up next morning and feel like I can face the world. So. Yeah, I really like that. So, who did you uh, learn from over the years? Well, I think you've been a you know you and I were on a very similar journey. You were about two years ahead of me, and still are. Mm -hmm. I won't. I'll give you credit. Thanks. You're still just just a little bit just ahead of me on, on a lot of the sk the skills and some of the some of the finer details of, of smithing. But I got the opportunity to learn from uh, well YouTube. I mean, Absolutely. Let's, let's face it. Yeah. <clears throat> YouTube is like uh, the encyclope encyclopedia uh, of of the world now. You, know, you want to learn something, you want to learn about something, you go to YouTube and you look it up. Uh, so I spent lots of time uh, watching YouTube Smiths, you know, with the basics, with the more complicated stuff. Uh, but I also spent time uh, in classes down at the uh, Goshen School of Blacksmithing with Jamie Geyer. Uh, I think my first trip down there, we spent uh, five days with Brian and Ed Brazil. Um, and so I got a really great opportunity to get those skills in early. And then uh, later on, I got a follow-up visit with Josh down in Oklahoma where we, where we had uh, a full week, a full week uh, of one-on-one -on -one time with Brian and Ed. So, you know, that's probably my biggest influence. Yeah, we made a lot of good power hammer tooling, yep. uh, which we'll talk about in a future episode. Uh, yep, and I brought a lot, of, a lot of those skills back to my own power hammer, which uh, hopefully you guys will get to see if you're a patron member of Josh's channel. We'll uh, we'll we'll talk a little bit about my power hammer um, and what I like and what it. I don't think there's a lot of dislikes, but uh, you know there are caveats to it. And what do you have? It is a uh, Ken's Custom Iron uh, MZ75. Uh, if you look at the sticker, it's MLZ. The ML is for Mary Lou, <laughs> Ken's wife. So very sweet person. Yep, she is. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And was, we certainly put it to the test this week. We uh, we ran that thing like <laughs> a sewing machine for hours and hours and hours. Uh, and we we had to mean we had to do some maintenance on it while we were doing it. Make sure we kept it clean, kept it well lubed. But other than that, she was hitting steel for a long, long time. So. Yeah. Now, is this full time or a hobby for you? Absolutely a hobby. You know, I'd, I'd want to monetize it a little bit, but I'm not here to make money. Uh, you know, I have a day job if I wanted to make money. You know, maybe I'd I'd shift over, but I'm still at the point in my life where, you know, my career needs to uh, to bring some money in. I've got kids in college, and one one that's probably going to cost me a bajillion dollars when she wants to go to some <laughs> private school. Uh, so I got one left in the house. But she's so. a fantastic artist. Oh man. 
crazy, crazy good. How many awards has she won recently? Uh, she she won this w one this week. Yeah, she she won a couple of great awards uh, from the Michigan State University Federal Credit Union. Um, uh, one of them was a judge award. One of them was a community award. And then while we were on our trip, we found out she won a uh, another award for her uh, for her pencil drawing, which we uh, were notified on Saturday, uh, and the award ceremony is today, Monday. Now, when you say pencil drawing, for the viewers, to clarify, it's colored pencil, but it is photorealistic. I mean, if you, if you see it, and I'm going to get some photos. Chris, you're going to send me some photos. Sure. And uh, we'll get them uploaded so that you guys can see exactly what we're talking about here, here, and here. Yeah. Because <laughs> she's, she's got an amazing talent. Yep. So we're... So I have to keep a good day job going while, while I support her work. Uh, and my wife and I are very, very proud. So, but. And your wife's a creator too. She's she is. Uh, getting into photography, photography, right? Yep. Yeah. She's a photographer. Uh, again, she has a day job, but you know, we have a house full of, of creators and makers. Uh, I can't, I can't stress enough how proud I am to have been able to pass that down to my kids, even even my older boys have their own creative outlets. Uh, one of them uh, is music. It's his creativity, and the other one uh, draws and, and loves to work with plants and you know, likes to make stuff. He comes to my shop and makes a gosh damn mess out of everything, and <laughs> at the end of the day, he's got something that he wanted built. Uh, and despite all the complaining uh, when I'm cleaning up after him, I love that he comes out here to, to do yeah. stuff. So really proud of my, my kids. Uh, for taking on the mantle of, of being a maker. So would you say you've uh, built up any kind of specialty over the years or still? Right now I'm, you know, I really want to make tools, uh, tools for the blacksmiths. I know that when I was uh, coming up, it was, you know, expensive and hard to find tools. My first, you know, tools were, you know, a, a cold chisel from the hardware store and ended up a punch a woodworking punch mm -hmm. <laughs> or a set you know I ruined both of those very quickly uh, after I after Josh and I uh, connected on the uh, blacksmithing level you had actually sent me my first real blacksmithing tools and I, I really felt that was the point where I felt I could move forward um, and so I want to make those tools for people and make them you know super affordable you know I'm not trying to make a bunch of money on them uh, just recover my time and, and effort um, you know, to give a, you know, an upcoming blacksmith, a, you know, a beginner, a set of tools that they can go do some of these, uh, finer, finer pieces with, you know, as a blacksmith develops, you're going to, you're going to want your own tools and learn how to make your own tools. But, you know, it really hurts the craft if, if we don't help these blacksmiths get moving. So making tools, I give a lot of tools away. Um, I sell them on my Etsy store. Uh, I'm very proud of, of the work that, that I've been able to do with this uh, with this process, and you know, I'll give away more. So nice. Uh, would you say you prefer coal or propane? You've got both. So. Well, Josh, you know the answer to that. I do, but these guys don't. <laughs> <laughs> so when Josh showed up, we were working on my coal forge, which is where I normally work out of. Uh, I run a. You can see it right behind me. Uh, this is all hand built. You know. Obviously, the tweer we bought and the uh, chimney we bought, but, you know, I built all the sheet metal. One thing you probably didn't notice is the pattern on the back of the forge. I did not. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll show you that before you leave. Okay. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I spent a lot of time with that, building out the, uh, built the forge the way I want it to be. Uh, you know, I have some regrets, and I would change some things about it. Uh, I might go with a side draft versus the over the overhead hood, but... Honestly, there's not one bit of smoke that gets in here after you get that thing lit. I mean, that thing just sucks it sucks air out of here. So I love the coal forge. It you know gives you that nice isolated heat where you want it, when you want it, and it, you can get high heat, you can get low heat. Um, so the propane forge really just has sat in the corner here for about two years. I don't think I've lit it up for anything uh, in that amount of time. Until I showed up. Until you show up and <laughs> we decide... We decided we want to give back and make some tongs, and that's production work, and that requires 
propane forge. So, yeah, and we put it through the test. We did. Um, I run anthracite. I was going to uh, ask. Yep. yep. <clears throat> so we had lots of conversations about that this weekend uh, down in uh, down in Lynchburg, Ohio, at, at the gathering sponsored by uh, Bar Run Forge. Uh, we talked a lot about coal and coke. Um, we'll one link of, up above. Yeah. One of the things that, uh, for me, I can get tractor supply, anthracite, you know, by 10, 12 bags, lasts me about a month and a half, maybe two months. You know, that's about 100 bucks. Uh, well, they're about 10 bucks a bag uh, up here in Michigan. But, um, you know, and I could run four hours on a, on a roughly about four hours on a bag make some clinker don't don't make any mistake about that it it's not the cleanest coal to run but i get that delivered to my doorstep you know i run out coal i use my one day free shipping from tractor supply and, and it shows up now goods and bads anthracite's a pain in the ass to work with you have to it doesn't work like bituminous it uh or coke um it's got two settings it's got uh you know, heat your coffee in the depths of hell, uh, and you always got to move air across it. So, you know, it takes a lot of attentiveness to make sure that you're you're in the right place in the fire. You know, forge welding is difficult because you it, you have to push so much oxygen through it. So, you know, for me, I had to learn how to forge weld in it, and it's not in the center of the stream of air. You've got to forge weld actually out to the side of the fire pot. So, I spent uh, spent a little bit of a learning curve learning how to forge in that, but. You know, if that's all the coal you have, have available to you, uh, feel free to, to use it. No one's going to think any less of you if, if that's what you got. Um, I've run bituminous, uh, but it's kind of hard to get up here, so uh, I've just opted to uh, run my shop on Anthracite today. You a member of any local organizations? Not yet a member of the Michigan Artisan Blacksmith Association, uh, but that is one of my local organization. Uh, I'm keeping an eye on them. Uh, I think we joked that I've printed the form off uh, to to uh, join to join them a number of times, but in, in about every time I go look for the checkbook and get distracted, just like most of us do. How long have I been prodding you? Uh, about five years. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it but, really uh, does make a difference <laughs> getting out there and hanging out with other Smiths. Yeah. Uh, and I try to I try to get out and hang out with other Smiths. You do. But, you do. Uh, but yeah, I, I need need more uh, more exposure to some of my local Smiths. I think would be great. Um, I am a member of Abana and uh, Salt Fork Craftsman. I've been a member of Salt Fork Craftsman. Yep. Yep. You've come down to our conference yep. and got to hang out and play with those folks. That's right. Uh, what inspires your work or who? Uh, I think, you know, Brian and Ed had a big inspiration in the work. I don't, I don't make their style of tool uh, that I, that I offer up to other blacksmiths. I make what I, Kind of what I found I liked, and that truly is a personal preference as far as you know the dimensions, the handle. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, learning how to make a tool is the most important part. You know, Brian and I taught me how to make tools, so I don't have to follow their style of tool. I've learned that I like a different style. You know, I like my handles a certain shape. I like a certain length. Uh, you know, stuff like that. But at the end of the day, you you have a punch. You grind a punch the same way. Everybody learns how to eventually how to grind a punch, you know, and how to, uh, how to form, how to form your tools into the shape you want. And that's, that's the important part about that. Do you attend any, uh, blacksmithing events? I do. We just got back from one that I really enjoy, which is, uh, which was the gathering at uh, bar run forge. Ton of fun. Yep. With some really great people. Thank you, Troy and Eli for having us out. And Mima for cooking for us. Fantastic food. The hospitality. Yeah, it was out. <laughs> was just ten out of ten. Off the hook. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, they put on a great event. Uh, we hauled the camper down and uh, camped out at their place. This is the third year of this event. Uh, second year that I've been able to attend. Uh, the first year I think it was uh, was just a couple Smiths. Last year I think ten or twelve Smiths, and this year I think it was up to twenty. Um, and that that's just a great community environment uh you know no one's no one's barking at anybody you know you're doing it wrong none of that no judgment eh, i mean the odd jokes <laughs> but the jokes are mostly 
Good natured. Towards Troy. Good natured, so. yeah. <laughs> Although I took some heat. Yeah. Keep, you watch the Bar on Forge videos, you'll, you may hear uh, some heat that I've taken myself. Yeah, all of those videos are on their, their YouTube page. I'll put a link right up here. But you can see uh, us goofing off and uh, Bill Corey and Roy Adams demonstrating tong making. Yep. Um, it was a week of tongs. The week of tongs. We made lots of tongs. Uh, we made six pairs. We already showed you the hammer-eye tongs. Yep. Uh, we gave one pair to Troy and Eli. We gave two to Jamie Geyer down in Goshen so that uh, they have some more tongs for the training classes they hold. Yep. And then we kept one for ourselves, of course. And uh, speaking of training classes, uh, Ed and Hanan will be hosting a Tools to Make Tools class up in Goshen in September. If you don't know how to make tools, I highly suggest you go yep. up and attend it. You, you won't get better training. Highly recommended. I think any time you spend, uh, you know, with with those guys, they're great teachers. Um, you know, they're willing to they're willing to spend one on one time to make sure that you understand the concepts and know how to how to do it right. So if you get a chance to attend one of those, you know, by all means do. Yep. Now, where can people find your work at, Chris? So I post some work up on uh, Etsy. Uh, you know, Facebook, of course, really just a proxy to get people to my Etsy page. But I'll post some works in progress on the Facebook. Um, but the finished works uh, currently sit on the Etsy. And, uh, you know, I'm planning on doing some shows, you know, maybe not this year, but I'd like to build up some stock and some uh, some repertoire to, uh, to fill out a table. But. And your YouTube channel is... Uh, it's just my name, Chris Schaefer. Probably not the only one out there. I suspect I'm not. But Josh will uh, probably pop a link. I'll put a link right here. Yep. And uh, what, what do you got going on over there? So on my YouTube channel, we're working on uh, a big project right now is restoring a 19 teens uh, American high-duty lathe. Uh, it's about 11 foot long, 20-inch uh, swing over the bed. And it is a monster. And I think monster. Josh will maybe take a picture or two and show it to you. But uh, over on my channel, we've so far taken the uh, the apron uh, and the saddle apart. You know, rebuilt all of that. And uh, coming up soon, we'll we'll put that back together. We'll start working on the headstock. But the idea of that is not to make a museum piece. It's a uh, you know I'd like to introduce that as a working part of the shop. You know, where we can you know make more things. And if you ask me what I'm going to do with it, I have no idea. <laughs> Stay tuned. I can't wait to see it running. Yeah. It's going to be cool. It's got a giant five-horse, three-face poker on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a beast. Yeah, it stands about six and a half foot tall, weighs about 5,000 pounds. Yeah, yeah, nothing like big iron. How, what advice would you give beginners? Well, I, I, hopefully you've heard some of my advice already, but... The most important thing is just get out, get some steel hot, find something to hit it on. <clears throat> you know, you don't have to go buy a four hundred dollar hammer from a YouTube blacksmith. Uh, I think they would all appreciate it, but you know, guys, don't hate me for it. Don't any trolls here, but you can go to you know your local uh, big box store, uh, pick up a sledgehammer, an engineer's ha hammer, uh, spend some time on YouTube. Lots of guys talk about how to dress your hammers. You know, when you buy those straight from the big box stores, they're going to have uh, you know, sharp edges, they're not going to have quite the right profile. But if you've got a, you know, four inch angle grinder and a flap disc, you can, uh, you can do a lot of work, get your hammer straightened out. And then what do you hit it on? You know, we're using anvils. Um, but you don't need an anvil. You can, you can have any piece of steel. It can even be mild steel. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, any block of steel, I would avoid cast iron at all costs if you can. Um, the railroad track. But railroad track, if you could find some legally, uh, you know, try to make sure you're not uh, stealing from the railroads. Uh, same goes for railroad spikes. Um, but, you know, Harbor Freight now has come out with a uh, the new Doyle anvil, um, which I've seen in person now. Uh, I've seen a lot of reviews on. Uh, looks like that might be a solid piece. Acacio, uh, Vivor, a number of other manufacturers make anvils that are 
reasonably priced, uh, but for the beginner, don't worry about that. Just get out, find something that you can put your steel on. You know, you don't want anything with hard edges, uh, you know, sharp, sharp edges. You want something that you bevel again, get your four inch angle grinder out, bevel your edges and, uh, and start, start working on it. There's a whole litany of instructional videos out there. Uh, and not to, not to, uh, put too much of a plug in, but Roy Adams probably has about a thousand of those videos. So feel free to check him out. Uh, he definitely has enough for you to get started. Um, and, uh, I think he would be happy if you, uh, you grew past him. Yeah. Uh, how about pricing? How you go about pricing your work? Market research. Uh, so there, there's a big range in pricing. So as a beginner, you might look at your work and say, man, that's, that really isn't as good as so-and-so, but you still put time into it, but you got to take some discount for, you know, for the quality of your work and don't put anything, you know, for sale that you don't, that you're not proud of. Uh, but I usually try to price it based on what I, what else I see in the market. And sometimes I look at it and say, you know, I, I spent three hours on that damn thing. I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to price it as I spent three hours on it, you know, and I have to, Look at what it costs around the shop, you know, from a from a very objective level. What does it cost for fuel? What does it cost, you know, to keep the lights on? Um, you know, and I have I have something in my head that that uh, goes kind of like an hourly an hourly shop rate that I include my own labor on, and uh, and that's kind of my minimum. I've got to I've got to sell something for that in order to to break even, and uh, I won't go below that. So a lot of other smiths will tell you the same thing. Uh, again, there are lots of videos where people are talking about the business of blacksmithing. Um, nobody's probably going to tell you what their pricing are, is, but uh, it's not, not that hard to find out. Just go look at their sites um, and do, do a little research. Don't be the bottom. Yeah. There's no reason to be the bottom. There's no reason to undercut. Uh, you're just racing to the bottom. Yep. Drives the market down for everybody. Right. Be, be fair in your pricing and people will buy it. Yep. Uh, what would you like to see in the future of blacksmithing? A lot more community. Um, I think there are pockets of great communities out there today. Um, but there's, there's probably more work to be done there. Uh, a lot of the local blacksmithing uh, clubs are not really embracing the technology side of, of it yet. Um, some are. The CBA, for example, out of California, uh, has had a really uh, great presence on online um, for their members. Uh, Sofa does does okay. Salt Fork does okay. Mm -hmm. You know, but other other local organizations need a little bit of work. Um, but join those organizations. Uh, you know, look for events in your area, uh, and your area might have to be bigger than you know 10, 20 miles. You know, we drove. Uh, you know, five hours, five hours to go uh, to go spend time with Great Smiths this weekend, and sometimes it's what you gotta do. So it's worth the gas money, I promise yeah. you. Yep. Uh, how would you feel about a journeymanship program in the U.S. if we could get one stood up? I think it'd be great. Um, I know that I I would have loved to have had um, someone reach out to me as a or someone I could reach out to as a beginning blacksmith and you know invite me to their shop and. And be able to go in and see what they do uh, and learn from them you know even if it's just the basics like how to draw a taper uh, that's more of the apprenticeship level but i see and you're thinking about more of the more of a the skill, advanced the advanced skills yeah. level yeah, yeah. Well, you know, youtube will take you a good long way and your local clubs can take you through the apprentice stage and and there's certainly nothing wrong with finding a smith that's willing to let you apprentice. But I feel like that's an extended time period. Yep. Um, but I'm talking more... About your journey. Yeah, like my journey where, right. I, you know, you host somebody for a week, they work in your forge while you're teaching them skills. Yep. No, and I think that's great. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know they think that's great you're here. <laughs> and I think a lot of other smiths think that... Think that think that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> Do we mention it's early? <laughs> it is early. <laughs> no. Yeah, I I had a blast with you coming coming in here, and I think you'll have a I think other Smiths will have a great time, uh, 
you know, hosting you and others. Um, it'd be great if we could have a, you know, kind of a registry of people who are willing to host yeah. and, uh, you know, post their availability of when they, when they'd be able to host. And that's what I'm hoping to get out of this is a solid list of people that are willing to uh, participate in a program like this. Yep. You know, I've been incredibly lucky and I've had a lot of people say yes to me and, uh, thank you for all of the yeses people. Uh, but I would love to see this become a long-term thing. Uh, you know, you carve out a week, two weeks, whatever you're comfortable with, and pair up with a Smith that you want to work with. Um, this was the hardest weeking, working uh, week of vacation <laughs> I think I've ever taken. Uh, Josh said he wanted to come up, and I took the week off and said, let's spend it in the shop. Let's do it. And, uh, yeah, I don't think I've worked this hard uh on a vacation. Yeah. <laughs> Any regrets, though? No, none no. whatsoever. Yeah. We, we had a blast. It's a really good time. Yeah. And I appreciate you letting me come up and hang out with you, as always. Great conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Josh. Yeah. Thanks, Chris.